So fields of fractions. Um, so welcome to everyone. So what we what did we do uh, on Wednesday? We took an, an integral domain. So and the book calls this chapter integral domains. Every every ring for a while is going to be an integral domain. Um, if I forget to say it, and we're trying to stick that integral domain into a field, uh, somehow invent fractions for any for any domain, much like you you have your whole numbers and then and then you come up you you invent these person numbers that you write as a fraction and these allow you to divide um, when you when you can't. So we we define what this is as a set uh, because a fraction is nothing but a pair of elements in the ring, uh, which we you know normally we write as a fraction. But um, for now, I won't for the simple reason that we all know how to operate with fractions, and I don't want us to be tempted to do things that we. Um, do things that we would naturally do, which is why I'm writing them as pairs. Anyway, a fraction is a pair of numbers, but different pairs of numbers could be representing the same fraction, uh, which means that there's some sort of relation between pairs telling them, tell me when the fractions are equal. So two pairs give me the fr same fraction when you cross multiply and you get uh, the same the same element in the ring. The nice thing, you know, it's a lot of ways of writing this for the integers because, you know, because you, you know real numbers, but writing the cross multiplication, um, that's something that, that's something that makes sense within the ring because I, I have multiplication in the ring. Okay, so this set of equivalence classes is a fraction set for now because, uh, so far, we haven't decided how we're going to add and multiply these, whether it even, you know. And once we do, we're going to have to figure out uh, if it forms a field. Anyway, uh, today we'll show that FR is the smallest field containing R. Good thing. And it's probably, it shouldn't even be clear what small list means. Um, so we have to answer that question as well. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna make it a field better, uh, learn how to do operations in it. So, so how do you add two fractions? You have two fractions. Um, in you have two fractions. Um, how do you define addition? Would it be for the first term a d plus c b? And then the second would be BD. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know this, right? So you you take uh, over the integers, you would try to make a common denominator. And uh, well, you would do that. I mean, you would take the, the least common multiple, but rings tend to not have at least common multiple. Um, so better to just find a common denominator that's not the smallest one, but rather just multiply by the same thing, the numerator and denominator. So wait, what am I doing? C, C, D. <clears> 
<clears throat> okay, so that's how we're supposed to define uh, addition and how are we supposed to define multiplication? This is easier, right? Yeah, it's just A, C, B, D. Right, you multiply numerator and denominator. Okay, <clears throat> so um, well, we have a lot of things to prove. Um, I'm gonna not prove absolutely everything because uh, oof, this could get really, really boring. Um, I mean, a field, checking that this is a field is like 10 many things. Uh, anyway, but I'm gonna write down everything I'm supposed to prove. So first of all, I am supposed to prove that addition and multiplication on, on the fraction, supposedly a field uh, are well-defined. What does this mean? What do I mean that they're well defined? What am I supposed to check here? Does that mean they're closed operations? Okay, yeah, well defined would mean that they're closed operations, but that, that's clear because, uh, well, you multiply two pairs and you get a pair, and I guess uh, the denominator is not going to be zero because we have a domain. So, um, but that's not the that's not the tricky thing. What is the what is the other thing we have to be really careful about? Is unique. What do you mean? Uh, like each operation will have a unique output. Right. Yeah. So why? So so of course every time you define an operation, the output should be there. Should be only one possible answer. There shouldn't be like several options for what adding two fractions means. So what could make this go wrong? How could the sum give you two different outputs. If one or more of them aren't in um, least terms. Right, yeah, okay, exactly. The thing is, you could, you could write the same fraction in two different ways, uh, so, the quit. I mean, you know this works over the integers, but does it always work? If you just write the same fractions in different ways, you get the same answer. And and you definitely should. If you if you don't, we uh, we are in big trouble. Okay, uh, Tiago and Roy get a bonus point. So, um, Wait, so so, so would. Two, two answers that are equivalent, would that be non-unique? Well, it, it, that, would, that wouldn't be a problem. Like here, of course, if we follow, if we follow our, our rules, this is supposed to be, the denominator here is gonna be six. Um, and the denominator here is gonna be 36. Oh, okay. But whatever we get here, that's not a problem because it should be the same fraction. 18 plus 24 is 42, yeah. So there are different pairs, but they're the same fraction, so that's fine. Uh, so another comment about what Tiago said is that 
I'm never I, I'm never talking about smallest terms because um talking about smallest terms means you can take a GCD and you divide by it. And the GCD is something that I don't want to assume I have. <clears throat> Otherwise, you know, you could you could think of fractions over the integers as just no, a pair of numbers that are uh, mutually prime, and then you wouldn't have to deal with equal fractions. Just say always write them in smallest terms, but that doesn't work so well. Um, okay, let me just finish writing what I was saying. If we start with equivalent fractions. The answers are equivalent. Um, okay. So, so for example, just to address that, if if you take if you take uh, the integers and you add the square root of negative three to them you you're gonna you're gonna have some trouble um because here so here you have a problem that four factors as as these two numbers and and that means well it's a similar example to one i've shown you before this is this reduces you can cancel the two sound, but you can also also cancel the the one plus root three sound, and and now which which of these is the smallest terms? Um, and the answer is I don't know, neither or both. There's no good answer to what the smallest terms fraction is often. Um, which is why I, I'm not going to use that notion. Okay, so let's show that this is well defined. Um, so I said I wouldn't do, I'm supposed to check that the sum and the product are well defined. Uh, I'm not going to do both. That would be, that would be pretty boring, I think. So, okay, so the, the book does it for, uh addition so you can go read addition in the book and i'll do it for multiplication So this is what I want to prove. I want to say if I have um, fractions written in two different ways and I multiply them, I get the same answer. So I multiply A1B1 times C1D1, I get the same answer as multiplying a to b to c to b to and then and of course you would need to do the same for addition okay so um oh I didn't turn the slide okay so i'm not going to do it for addition but it's in the book written out or you, you should be able to do it yourself after you see multiplication it's pretty much the same and now I'm saying, what do I need to show for multiplication? You take a fraction, you write it two different ways, and you do the same for the other fraction. When you multiply them, you get you get the same answer. <clears throat> so um, how do I how do I prove this?
I'm thinking just go ahead and um, do the multiplication and then you'll see that um, either, well, in both numerator and denominator, I guess, um, the, the difference between the product uh, A1B1 and C1D1 versus A2B2 and C2D2 is just going to be um, some greatest common divisor in the form of another fraction, right? Like call it uh, E, F or something. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm multiplying them. And now how do I know that these two are, are the same? Well, so because we have to be able to express um, uh, a a one b one or or no we if you have to be able to express a two b two as um, a one b one times you know some n n where n is you know any any integer and then you can do I, I'm I know it's not rigorous at all but I'm kind of just thinking it out loud you could you know what I'm trying to get at <laughs> yeah I know what you're trying to get but um... It works for a lot of rings. Um, it works for unique factorization domains, which is the next topic. Um, but the thing is, not it doesn't work for every ring. For example, here, so these two fractions are the same number. They're and they're also this fraction. So you when you multiply the numerator and denominator by two, you get this fraction. When you multiply by one plus root negative three, you get the same. You get the same fraction. These two are equal, but neither is a multiple of the other. There's no so neither of them is the smallest term fraction. But what we do know is that they're the same because cross multiplying uh, gives me the same answer. <clears throat> cross multiplying oh, two by two. So, so the name of the game is to cross multiply every time you you have two fractions that are equal because that is guaranteed to work. And what is not guaranteed to work is to write things in smallest terms. So, how would I show that these two fractions are the same? You can do a one c one times b two d two. Cool. Right, so I cross multiply those fractions exactly. So what I need to prove is that a one c one b two d two is a two c two b one d one, and why would that be true? If the fractions are the same, so then that would imply A1 and A2 are similar. So if they're all like similar in the sense that there's only um, like they're multiples of each other. So it should be equal. So again, they're not multiples of each other. Um, if I know that these fractions are the same, there is one thing that I know. Um, and it said, I get the same answer cross multiplying. I know that A1, B2 is B2, A1. So multiplying these is the same as multiplying those. And then likewise, C1, D2 is, is the same as D1, C2. Right, and I'm multiplying those two together. Uh, it's all I. That's all I need. So, from from I guess from here, knowing that these two fractions are the same means that uh, the first fraction gives me a product which is the same. The other fraction gives me another product. And now 
I know that if I multiply these two together, the multiply the two equations, I get a one b two c one d two equals a two v one c two v one. Oh, here yeah, I wrote the, the wrong indices. I mean that was true. A uh, thing does equal itself, but <clears throat> and this is this is what I needed. <clears throat> okay. Any questions? Okay. Uh, so the fraction set now has an addition and multiplication that are well defined. I guess I should be careful. Um, also, the denominator is not zero. Because we're in a domain and neither of the denominators are zero. <clears throat> okay, uh, so we have addition and multiplication. Now, of course, we should show that it's a ring, um, and I'm not, I'm not gonna <clears throat> go prove all of these because it's um, well, it's long and it's not exciting. Uh, well, it's only a ring; it's a field. So, okay, um, so what is the, the additive identity? What is, what is zero? What is the fraction zero? It's zero and any, well, the denominator doesn't really matter. So zero B. Right, um, let's just say zero divided by one. Okay, so let's check that. If you if you add zero one plus anything, I get, um, well, I'm supposed to multiply the denominators together and then do A times zero plus, no, B times zero plus A plus a times one, which is a b. Okay, um, what is the multiplicative identity? One, one. One, one, right. If you multiply this is even easier. You multiply AB by one, one, you get AB. Okay, um, so lots of things we need to check. Um, we need to check that the sum is associative. Um, I'm not gonna do that because it's just a matter of writing out yeah, I'm not going to do that. Uh, let's check that the sum is commutative. And we, we already seen that it has identity, so that makes it a group with addition. Uh, we need to check that the product is associative, which is, um, 
also just write out, well, let, let's do one, just a matter of writing out the definitions. Um, so if you want to multiply three fractions, you need to make sure that the, the brackets um, don't change the answer. So if I multiply the first two together, that would mean I'm multiplying, I'm getting this answer, and then I multiply it ACE, BDF. And unsur unsurprisingly, if I go the other way, you get the same answer. Uh, because multiplication in the original ring is associative. Okay, so um, that almost makes it a ring. We need to check um, that the distributive property, which I mean they're all they're all very easy. Um, I'm not going to do it either. So this makes it a ring. Well, a ring with unit. If we if we check that the the product is commutative, which is I, I mean I think this is just all writing the definitions. Uh, this will make it a commutative ring, and then all we need is to show it's a field. Are there any questions about this? I mean the the book does it also doesn't do all of them but it, it does some of them in more detail. Uh, Lemma 18.3. But I think most of the stuff we do is harder than this. Uh, so finally, to show it's a field, we need to show that uh, and anything has a multiplicative inverse. which is the whole point of this, to get a field and not a ring. So what is the multiplicative inverse of a fraction A divided by B? B over A. B over A, right. So what we need to do is, is check that the product is the identity. So I multiply numerator and denominator, I get AB divided by AB. And now this is, uh, this is equal to one. And the reason for that is that cross multiplying, I get the same answer. <clears throat> I guess, I mean, <clears throat> you're not guaranteed to be able to cancel things. Um, I don't actually remember if I did this on Wednesday. Okay, so from now on, I'm gonna, so let's see. Um, you can cancel uh, something that is multiplying the numerator and denominator. Because, um, when you multiply, when you cross multiply, AC times B is BC times A. So you can go like this. Okay, so given that we know, you know the properties we've shown, I'm comfortable, I'm confident that we can write um, fractions as fractions. Um, Because I think we've checked everything you would ever do with fractions. Um, you you would cancel things from the top and the bottom. You would add them and multiply them like we do. 
Um, the only thing we, I guess there's one more thing, which we, which we do like to do with fractions. Okay, so if you, if you go back to what I promised or the goal was, I was, I was saying, I was saying that the fraction field is the smallest field containing uh, our starting ring. So, so far we know that the fraction field is a field, haven't checked that it contains R, uh, I haven't checked or said what it means to be the smallest. So let's see. Um, So they're not, I mean, they're not contained. No two things, no, no, the sets are never containing each other. Um, you know, they're, they're not, I mean, it's not literally true that they're contained, but what it, what is true is that there is an injective map from, from the ring to the field. Uh, so we, we might as well think that it's contained. Let's just call it feet. Um, so if I have an element in the ring, how do I think of it as a fraction? How is an how is a whole number a rational number? Would be a comma one, right? Exactly. Okay, and the tensor gets a bonus point. Um. Yeah. So um, we need to prove this. So. <clears throat> so that's one thing we do with fractions. If if I if you write three over one, you just write three. Um. And so far. We haven't shown that this that this works. Um, so, so let's do that. Um, we need to check. We need to check that phi sends zero to zero, one to one, preserves addition and multiplication. Um, but we've said that zero divided by one is is the additive identity, and one divided by one is the multiplicative identity. So that's fine. Now, what is um what happens with sums are hopefully summing in the ring is the same as summing fractions with denominator one by definition this is a plus b divided by one and when you take two fractions and you uh so you first write the fractions and you add them together well this is supposed to be a times one plus b times one divided by one times one, and these are indeed equal. So we we did uh, we did get that it commutes with addition, and finally let's see that it preserves multiplication. If I if I write the fractions and and I multiply them, well, I get a b divided by one, which is indeed the image of a b. And finally, so. This shows phi is a homomorphism. Uh, finally, the last thing I need to check is that phi is injective. So how do I check that phi is injective?
you just show for every uh, rational for every number in a in your domain you have a fraction. No, that's showing that it's defined. If for every number you can write it as a fraction, that just means that. Uh, well, that means that the map is defined. That means every input should have exactly one output. So I'm trying to injective means that no two di that different things don't uh, different things don't map to the same thing. So if if a and b are different, a divided by one and b divided by one are different. But that's not how you check that a ring homomorphism is injective. How do you check that a ring homomorphism is injective? This is for a group homomorphism. Don't you see you set to to uh, like psi of a one equals psi of a two, and you prove that a one equals a two. So you you can do it that way, uh, but that is not the easiest way. There's an easier way um, that that you learn in abstract algebra one, pretty sure. What happens to what happens to the kernel? Oh, the kernel should just be the identity, right? Right. Uh, any homomorphism, if you show to show its injective, um, you need to show that the kernel is zero. So the kernel, remember that the kernel is the set of things that map to zero. So if the kernel is zero, um, this always means that it's injective because uh, having two different things is the same thing as saying that their difference is not zero, which is the same as saying that, well, if, if you're not zero, you're not in the kernel. Uh, so your image is not zero. And by by the fact that phi commutes with sums because it's a homomorphism, that's all you need. This is something. It's kind of pretty much the first isomorphism theorem. A bit it's a special case. Uh, if you don't remember, you can go back and check it. Okay, so. You claim that the kernel is zero. So if we have an element in the kernel, we need to show that it's zero. So being in the kernel by definition means that your image is zero. And but the image of phi by definition is a over one. This means that a over one is zero over one. And just by what it means to be equal as fractions, that means that when you cross multiply, a is zero. So if anything in the kernel is zero, that means that the kernel is just the set containing zero. Okay, so um, what we have now is that the ring, um, the ring basically is contained in the field of fractions, just like the integers are contained in the rationals. Oof. Any questions?
So, I mean, the, the challenge today is not doing the proofs, it's knowing what it's supposed to prove. Um, so you can think of R as the fractions with denominator one. It's, a, it's an isomorphic ring. Um, again, by the first isomorphism theorem. So we need to show that it's the smallest. So um, what does it mean uh, to be the smallest? The thing is there's a lot of possible fields containing R and they're not like all containing the same thing. So we can compare them. Uh, but what we can say is the following. If F, uh, sorry, if R, um, is contained in a field K. Um, <clears throat> then there exists a unique homomorphism. You know, say injective going from FR to K. Um, which is the identity on R. The identity on R means that phi of A over one is A over one. As I said, uh, K contains R. Okay, so this is what I mean by being the smallest. I mean, any field containing R somehow has to contain the field of fractions. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So suppose R is contained in a field. I need to define P. So um, any element in the fraction field is going to be of the form A divided by B. So how am I gonna, where am I gonna send A over B? This is supposed to be an element in K, right? P is supposed to take things in the fraction field and land in K. So, um, so where should we send the elements A over B? They should just go to A over B, right? Um, yes, but what does that mean? So what what about what about wh why why does this formula make sense? Because you can already express 
those elements in the field um, as fractions. And why can I why can I, I divide? Well, that's kind of like Why can I why can I divide? Okay. What about the what about the the hypothesis of the theorem? Say that this expression makes sense because it does. But you need to be clear about why. One answer, so we can have a weekend. Why can't you divide? Because if it was some subtraction or multiplication, I would be like, okay, we're working with rings. That's always that always makes sense. But why does division make sense? Is it because it's not unique? Because it's not unique? Why, what is not unique? Uh, addition. I don't understand. I'm sorry, never mind. Okay, it's. Um, it's because it's because K is a field. Um, a over B is A B inverse. Um, because we have inverses for multiplication, we can we can divide, we can write any fraction we want as long as B is not zero. Uh, okay, so we'll check the details on Monday. Um, All right, have a good weekend. Remember to have